So, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, happiness is uh, something that all of us seek at one level or the other. And this question of uh, defining happiness has turned out to be a very important one for researchers. Um, since in the last about 15 years or so, it has become a very prominent topic of focus. But um, the interesting thing about happiness is that uh, if uh, you were to ask somebody, how happy are you? You know, they don't go, what exactly do you mean by happiness? You know, so people are not confused when you ask them this simple question, how happy are you? You know, they're able to come up with an answer. Oh, you know, I'm feeling good today or, you know, today's not a bad, today's not a good day or whatever. Uh, so it seems like people have an intuitive understanding of what happiness means. And uh, it turns out that um, that intuitive understanding of what happiness means is good enough. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, measuring happiness, um, um, you know, sometime later. But... Uh, I just want to start out by saying up front that uh, this question of what exactly happiness is, uh, is maybe more important in our own heads than it turns out to be in practicality. That is that people have an intuitive understanding of what happiness is. Um, that said, um, I should say that uh, um, there have been attempts at trying to categorize different kinds of positive feelings um, and uh, label them and... Uh, try and identify some uh, markers of each of these positive feelings. And that attempt at trying to identify differences among different kinds of positive feelings, I think is a worthwhile attempt because it clarifies the whole domain for us, right? And um, nobody would argue with the, you know, idea that happiness is a positive feeling, right? But beyond it, what exactly is it is the question. And uh, there is a, a researcher at uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her name is uh, Barbara Fredrickson. And she has a couple of books out. One of them is called Positivity. Another one that just came out is called Love 2.0. And um, in the book Positivity, um, she talks about 10 different possible kinds of uh, positive feelings that you might have. And um, she rank orders them in the order of prevalence. How frequently do people experience these positive feelings? And you might equate each of those positive feelings with your definition of happiness. You know, so... Uh, the first uh, most prevalent kind of feeling is uh, one that uh, she calls joy. Um, and it's a feeling that you get when you think that life is going well, you have everything you need, uh, you're not really wanting anything major, you're probably you know, physically healthy, uh, you're surrounded by pleasant sensations and pleasant people and experiences and so on. Um, and that's the most, perhaps the uh, feeling with which most people associate the word happiness. Um, and then uh, you could have you know, a feeling such as serenity, um, which is a more tranquil feeling compared to joy. Joy is more uplifting and more, um, you know, stimulation oriented. Uh, you're more curious, you're more exuberant. Serenity is uh, more calm. Um, and that's the second most prevalent feeling, uh, positive feeling that people experience. Um, now, it turns out that uh, even between these two, some people might associate happiness with more of that feeling of joy, of, you know, almost like a frisky lamp, a little puppy playing around. Right? Uh, and other people might uh, associate it more with this feeling of serenity. Um, and even among cultures, there's differences. So it turns out that people from the East tend to associate happiness more with this feeling of serenity. People from the West tend to associate it more with the, this feeling of joy, uh, a more upbeat feeling. There's a paper by uh, actually marketing people. Uh, I'm in the marketing department. Jennifer Arker from Stanford and Cassie Mogilner from Important, they've examined this difference. It turns out older people tend to associate happiness more with serenity, younger people more with uh, this feeling of joy. Uh, and Barbara Fredrickson goes on to list eight other kinds of feelings, including love, awe, hope, and so on. All of these are positive feelings. Everybody would agree with them. And each of those could actually tap into what people personally think of or equate to this feeling of happiness. Now, I have done some research on this topic too. And uh, what we did was, Rather than ask people directly, what does happiness mean to you, which basically kind of shuts them up, you know, it's a very good way to shut people up at a party, for example, go and ask them, hey, by the way, what's your definition of happiness? You know, they start blabbering. Um, but the way to get at people's definition of happiness, or at least their implicit definition of happiness, is to ask them, tell me something that happened the last time that you were really happy. What happened? Right. And you ask them to write it down. Then you can content analyze what they say. And you can then figure out, okay, this is what this person associates um, you know, happiness with, this, this kind of a feeling. If you do that, it turns out um, among, you know, business school folks. So I'm in the business school, right? So 
Um, I've done these studies with undergraduate and MBA students and you know, in corporations and so on. Uh, it turns out that uh, the most common kind of event with which people associate the term happiness um, is uh, one of social connection. Um, so I visited home for Diwali or you know, um, I had a get together with my friends at my home. That's the feeling, um, that's the kind of experience with which people associate the word happiness. So it seems like a sense of connection, love, belongingness, that kind of a thing. Second most common is one of pride. And, you know, so about 40% come up with an event that has to do with love or connection, and then about 30% come up with pride. Um, now, there are two kinds of pride, it turns out. You know, one is what you might call hubristic pride, where I feel superior to another person, and therefore I feel happy. You know, I won that race, or I got that award, I won the case competition, or nabbed that girl that everybody was after, that kind of a feeling. Uh, then there's something called authentic pride, um, which has more to do with kind of, being better than you were before. You know, so it's not comparing yourself to other people, it's comparing yourself to who you were before. Um, and so, for example, that I just, you know, uh, learned um, to become a better presenter, you know, or I learned this new skill, I'm no longer afraid of math, um, that kind of a thing. So authentic versus hubristic pride. So there are all these different ways of uh, looking at, you know, labeling positive emotions, and each of those could potentially be um, equated to happiness. Um, and I think that people implicitly associate one kind of feeling or maybe a, a cluster of feelings with the word happiness. What is important is that they don't get confused by the question, what is happiness to you? As the kind of story goes uh, in psychology, um, uh, most of psychology has been focused on looking at what you might call negative deviations from normality. You know. So looking at, uh, you know, you might, if you think about Freud, for example, right, uh, many people consider him to be the father of psychology, certainly psychiatry. But, um, you know, he looked at people who had all these repressed dreams or, you know, childhood problems that somehow kind of uh, were manifested as abnormalities in a negative way, right? And that was the focus of most of psychology, looking at abnormal behavior in a negative, uh, in, a, in the negative direction. Um, and the idea was that uh, it's more important to fix the uh, negative uh, kind of deviations and make people normal, uh, and that's much, much more important than looking at people who are thriving as opposed to merely surviving, right, or failing to survive, uh, and looking at the characteristics of the people who are thriving and flourishing. But in 1998, uh, the then president of the American Psychological Association, um, a professor at the... Uh, University of Pennsylvania's uh, psychology department called uh, Martin Seligman um, came up with a, a charge, you know, and he said that, look, we've been focusing so much and obsessing about the negative side of human beings, uh, but perhaps we have a lot to learn from people who are on the positive side of normal, you know, and many of us are, you know, by definition, average or normal. So rather than looking at how do we correct these people who are on the negative side and make them normal, why don't we also look at, you know, people who are feeling normal and make them more positive, make them lead life in a more fulfilling, thriving, flourishing fashion. And so then the focus started uh, on to look at um, people who are, you know, on the positive side. Uh, and so you could say that this field, what's called positive psychology, began with that um, presidential address in 1998. And um, since then, it's just remarkable how much work has <laughs> happened in this field. You know, it goes to show how I think at some level, all of us are really, really deeply interested in this question of what does it take to lead a flourishing, thriving, beautiful, fulfilling, meaningful life. And um, just, just a lot of work that's uh, been uh, done since then. As you might know, uh, I'm going to be offering a Coursera course on happiness uh, starting in June um, through uh, ISB. And uh, as part of the uh, course, I've uh, interviewed uh, over 20 people who are uh, experts uh, in some subdomain of happiness. Um, I had the pleasure and the privilege of interviewing um, Professor Ed Diener, who's known around the world as uh, Dr. Happiness, um, because he kind of uh, is the father of the field in, in many ways. You know, even though Martin Seligman was the person who came up with this charge uh, in 1998, uh, Professor Ed Diener has been working on the topic of happiness uh, from the mid-1980s. Um, and um, he doesn't call it happiness, he calls it subjective well-being, or used to call it that because that sounds a little more scientific, you know, to your point. Um, 
And so happiness has been dogged with this problem of whether it's measurable and so on. And uh, when I interviewed Professor Ed Diener and I asked him this question on whether happiness is measurable and what was his opinion on it, uh, he started out by saying that um, he spent the first 10 years of his life, um, you know, when, when he started examining subjective well-being, devoted to this question of can we measure it and how reliable it is, is it and so on. And the good news is that, and this ties back to what I said earlier, that when you ask people how happy they are, they are not confused. The good news is that um, uh, it's the, perhaps the easiest measure of happiness, uh, which is the self-report, you know, just how happy are you, you know, on a 10-point scale, let's say, um, is uh, actually a very, very valid measure of happiness. It turns out that, for example, if I were to ask you how happy are you, Chitti, um, and you tell me, let's say, 7 out of 10, right? And I ask your family members, I ask your children, your wife, your you know, relatives, your colleagues, etc. Um, and I take the average of all those people, there's a very high correlation between your report of your happiness levels and how happy they think you are, right? So there is something that's going on that everybody's tapping into, right? I mean, maybe your demeanor, how much you smile and so on. Now, I could measure it in a more quote-unquote scientific fashion. I could, you know, take a sample of your blood and look at, you know, your... Uh, serotonin levels, for example. And it turns out that uh, even if I do that, there's a very high correlation between your serotonin levels and your self-reported measure of happiness. Now, it turns out that uh, there are other ways of looking at happiness which could again be considered more objective or scientific. Like for example, I could do a brain scan and uh, it's well established now that uh, you're happier um, when certain parts of your brain light up, um, particularly on the left, uh, you know, frontal, uh, uh, neofrontal cortex, uh, prefrontal cortex, that lights up, um, it, it turns out that uh, those kinds of people are happier, who have a thicker, uh, you know, left prefrontal cortex. And uh, so it turns out that when people report uh, being happier, that part of the brain lights up more. Um, it turns out that uh, there are many downstream consequences that you can look at. Uh, now it's well established that happy people live longer. Uh, in general, happy people are uh, more um, creative, more productive, have healthier lives, are more likely to get along better with other people, more likely to get married. Uh, and uh, if, even if you don't look at it at an individual level, but expand it out to a county level, right? Uh, counties that in the US, for example, that um, have more happy people tend to have fewer incidents of sickness, fewer, uh, you know, uh, people getting into emergency situations in the hospitals, uh, fewer cases of heart attacks, uh, depression, and so on. And so um, it just seems to us that uh, as happiness researchers, that uh, this question of measuring happiness could have in fact been a very, very difficult question that dogged the whole field. Because if you can't measure it, then you can't study it, right? But it turns out that um, these um, fears were at, at some, in some sense kind of unfounded that the simplest measure of happiness, you know, directly asking people, uh, turns out to be a pretty reliable and valid measure of happiness. Now, that's not to say that that's 100% the case. I think there are some, um, you know, uh, contextual variables. Like, for example, if you've just won the lottery, right, or if it's a really sunny day, you know, um, you're likely to be happier. And if I ask you the question, um, after asking you how, you know, do you, like the weather and the weather is great and ask you, do you like the weather first before I ask you how happy you are? That's going to bias your response to how happy you are. So I think it's very important to make sure that those kind of biasing influences are not there. Uh, and in some cases, it turns out that uh, people don't have a very good awareness of um, their own happiness levels. And so other people report, uh, you know, you as being far less happy than you report yourself as being. And all. But by and large, it's a very reliable measure. And that's very heartening to know. answer seems to be yes. By and large, it seems to be yes. Now, um, you know, there are many different things that you could do um, in order to lead a happier and fulfilling life. And I say this on the basis of the studies that have looked at these many different things, and I'm going to talk about some of them. Um, and to the extent that you're similar to those other